Welcome to episode 36 of the Practical EdTech Podcast. I'm Richard Byrne. Today is March 6, 2020. Let's start this episode of the podcast talking about a topic that everyone's talking about, COVID-19 or coronavirus and its potential impact on schools. Superintendents here in Maine were gathering in Augusta today to talk about plans for dealing with uh, an outbreak of coronavirus or the spread of coronavirus in Maine if, uh, and how to handle that. So I'm interested to see what comes out of that meeting. Uh, I'm not a superintendent, so I was not privy to what happened in the meeting, but uh, they were meeting today, and so I'm interested to see what happens. Uh, there are schools around the country that are now closing for various periods of time. Uh, one in Plymouth, not far from, not that far from here, was closed yesterday. I saw on the news, saw that in the news this morning. All that to say that this week I've gotten a lot of emails and tweets from and a Facebook message from people who are interested in or are asking for advice on teaching from home or remote teaching and looking for tools and strategies for that. So yesterday I put together a fairly good list, I think, of tips and tools for teaching remotely. You'll find that up on freetechforteachers.com right now. I published that last night, Thursday, Thursday night, uh, March 5th. And I kind of broke it into four parts. Some tips for giving live online instruction. And that's largely based on my practice from the last 10 years of doing a ton of webinars. And I'm not exaggerating when I say I've done more than a thousand webinars over the last 10 years. And so I tried to share as many tips as I could from that. Uh, if you haven't read the blog post yet, yeah, I'll highlight a few things here. Number one, try to keep your webcam on as much as possible. People like to see your face. They want to make that connection. And it's been proven that people are more likely to engage with your screen if they see you as opposed to if they're just looking at your static screen. And you want to try to keep things moving. Try to keep some, some things happening on your screen as much as possible. Try to keep it engaging. Uh, the other thing I'll mention about the webcam is try to elevate it to at least your eye level, if not higher, so that people aren't looking up at you, looking up your nose. Um, it just presents a nice, cleaner image and overview of, of the screen. If you want a good example of, of doing this, besides watching the video for this podcast, uh, take a look at Tony Vincent's presentation from the Practical EdTech Creativity Conference. That was back in December. Tony did a really great job of modeling those things, even though he probably wasn't trying to model those things. That's what he ended up doing. His webcam is elevated. It's actually shooting down a little bit on him, and he looks at the camera when he's trying to make points or iterate a point. A couple other quick little things. Try to pepper your, pepper your lesson with more kind of check-in questions than you normally would use. Right? If you're teaching online, even if you're using Google Hangouts Meet where you can see the other see the, the students on the other side, or you're using Microsoft Teams where, again, you can see people on the other side, you still don't get to read the room the way you do when you're in the classroom with your students. So do a whole lot of check-ins. Do more check-in type of questions than you normally would use. And ask kids to ask questions. Encourage kids to ask questions. You may have to do that more than you would if you were, typical, if you were in your typical classroom. Okay. Um, now, if you're doing recorded instruction, some of the same tips apply. Try to look at the webcam as much as possible. Try to keep it short and sweet when you're doing recorded lessons. Better to have two five-minute lessons than one 10-minute long lesson. Students will watch those two five-minute lessons, but they won't sit all the way through one 10-minute lesson. It's just this weird quirk of how we process information, we, we you know how we think of it. Think of it like chapters in a book, right? If you told your kids at the beginning of the school year, you're going to have to read you know, three novels, 
they're going to groan and they're not going to be as excited about it or they're not going to do it if you say you got to read these three novels as if you say you've got to read one chapter tonight you got to read one chapter tomorrow night and so on and so forth it's kind of the same idea so. and again try to keep the screen active you know, toggle back and forth between opening up your your screen and focusing on your webcam you know move those back and forth i'm using screencast-o-matic which makes it really easy to go back and forth between your webcam and your screen screencastify will also do the same thing so if you're using a chromebook screencastify does the same thing so some things to just some things to consider there a good model of recorded lessons with slideshows can be found by going to tom ritchie's youtube channel he does a nice job of modeling how to use slides and your webcam to create a, create a lesson. Now, for the tools for hosting the online instruction, as I already mentioned, Google Hangouts Meet is available to G Suite for Education users. And until July 1st, Google has increased the capabilities of Hangouts Meet for G Suite for Education, which means you can have up to 250 people in your Hangout and it will now record and save directly to your Google Drive. Microsoft has done a similar thing. They've expanded their availability of their Microsoft Teams tools for hosting web conferences. And if either of those aren't an option for you, check out Zoom, zoom.us. They have a free plan where you can have a live broadcast of up to 100 people. Now, in terms of your tools for creating recorded lessons, you have you can do it really simple and just set up a set up a little whiteboard in your classroom, right? So it can be like this. I've got this little whiteboard here. Just use that little whiteboard and you know put it up on your wall and boom, 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 do your lesson right there in front of your webcam. Real simple, easy thing to do. Uh, you can use your webcam. You might use your phone. You know, use a YouTube app on your phone to record the lesson, and you can do a quick edit and publish it okay. and of course you can share it through Google Classroom if that's an option for you um, or Microsoft Teams wherever you want to share it okay. show me there's plenty of plenty of whiteboard style apps out there uh, show me is one that's been around for years that's why that's why I listed it but explain everything would be fine you know, there's a whole bunch of them like that Flipgrid has a whiteboard function of course you do a short lesson in, in Flipgrid the same way by again kind of Hold up your uh, your whiteboard or put your whiteboard on your wall at home and away you go. Uh, Wakelet's got, uh, got that capability. And last but not least, if you want to do check-ins, you know, make sure you, you use something like Edpuzzle for your, for your recorded lessons. Drop your lessons into Edpuzzle, drop your videos into Edpuzzle, and add some questions into your videos for kids to answer as they're watching so they don't just fast forward through your video. So I've gone really long on the answer to those questions of remote instruction, but I hope that part of the webinar or that part of the podcast was worthwhile for some of you or, or most of you listening. For other suggestions on remote teaching or you know teaching online, Larry Ferlazzo has a great collection going as well. He's got a good collection of resources. You might want to check out his resources. Um, the last thing I'll say about teaching online or doing online instruction, it is different than being in your classroom. It does take some practice. It's not going to go perfect the first time. It's not going to go perfect the 10th time. But the big thing to keep in mind that I've said, you know, do those check-ins, do those frequent check-ins as much as possible in your, if you're doing a live broadcast and make sure you're looking at your webcam whenever possible. Students want to see your face. You want to keep that connection going. All right, so on some lighter notes, some new tools, neat things that are out there uh, in the last week. Jigsaw Explorer is a tool that I featured last weekend. Uh, just a quick, easy way to make your own jigsaw puzzles. Uh, a tool that Larry Falazzo actually shared uh, this week as well, called Team IMG, is a tool for collaborating on images. Kind of a neat little thing. Uh, I'm not sure that the world needs another place to find public domain images, but it can't hurt. Uh, PixFuel 
is a new service where you can px fuel pxfuel.com new place for finding public domain images a lot of ads on the site but a lot of free images too uh, some of the new tools out there unscreen.com thanks to greg kulowick for sharing this on twitter uh, lets you remove the background from your videos kind of a cool little tool uh, you can kind of do a simple little green screen with your uh, with your videos so check that out unscreen.com cool little tool uh, so open culture is a service that, uh, a blog that i've followed for 10 years maybe longer now uh, i'm trying to think as yeah it's been 10 years it's been at least 10 years maybe 12 years i've been following open culture uh, and this week they had a neat little blog post about uh, the 20,000 VHS recordings from the 1980s and 90s that are housed on the Internet Archive. And it is just a random collection of VHS tapes uh, co covering all kinds of things, like something from Burning Man. And then there's a block of just four hours of MTV from 1995 that was recorded on VHS tape, and someone put it on the Internet Archive. If you're nostalgic for the 80, for 80s and 90s pop culture, check that out. Um, educational value of it, not sure it's that high, but you know, might be worth looking at. But on a serious note, the Internet Archive does host historic campaign presidential campaign commercials, which may be interesting to evaluate in a social studies class or in a media media studies class. So. There's, a, there's your little nugget of educational purpose for the Internet Archive for this week. And the last thing I want to share in the news and notes, uh, PythonAnywhere.com is a service that one of my students is using. I actually started, I started using it because I was trying to help him. Uh, so this gets into our thoughts and reflections for the week. Um, I have one student who's a senior this year. And he is working on developing an app in Python, uh, a web app, and he's coding it in Python. And we're now at the stage of finding hosting for the project and getting it actually online and published. Uh, so it's a neat little AI app. I think I've mentioned it before. It's, called, it's uh, an app where you can type in a word and it will spit out a dad joke for you based on that word. It's a neat little, neat little project he's working on. So anyway... We're looking for a place to host it, and we were looking at Amazon's AWS and some other options, and we kind of stumbled into Python Anywhere uh, for hosting the project, but also turns out PythonAnywhere.com has some tools for teaching Python. I didn't know that. I was not aware of that until, until uh, just yesterday, actually, Thursday. So check that out, PythonAnywhere.com. If you're a computer science person, check that out. All right. Thoughts and reflections. On Tuesday, I got to spend the day at the Inspired Learning Convention in Upton, Massachusetts. I was wicked tired by the time I got there. I, my daughter, my daughter was up most of the night, and so I and I had to get up at 3 a.m. anyway to drive down there to be there on time. So, uh, so I was running on short sleep, but got to see Matthew Dix give a great keynote. Uh, Talked, he talked about giving students more ownership of the classroom and kind of taking your hands off the reins a little bit. It was a good good talk. It was, it was an entertaining talk. Uh, I, I wouldn't say that it was something that was like groundbreaking, but it, he told some great stories uh, and really drove home the point of you know, letting kids have more control in the classroom. And listening to kids, giving them ownership, they can do great things. So, uh, so a, a good good talk. If you get a chance to see Matthew Dix give a, give a keynote, I highly recommend it. doing it. It was excellent. Uh, now, my workshops there, I was scheduled to do three. Uh, I did one on podcasting, did podcast classroom podcasting one hundred and one, which I'm going to offer as a webinar next week. By the way, so go to practicaledtech.com and you'll find information about that. But that was standing room only, if you will. Uh, all, the, all the chairs were taken. All the chairs were taken for that one. And likewise, my AR and VR uh, workshop was well attended. Uh, also, also full. 
had some technical glitches there, uh, but otherwise went 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 well. The workshop I was the most excited to do, and that I actually spent the most time bringing more bringing new materials into. No one came to. <laughs> so I've done my podcasting one on one workshop before, and so I didn't have to do a whole lot of you know I did some revision, but I didn't have to do a whole lot of new prep for that one. Likewise, my AR and VR one, I did some revision, but not, but it wasn't an entirely new thing. Uh, my electronics and, and maker spaces. So the, the title was using electronics and maker spaces, which was mostly about Arduino, but some other stuff. Uh, I spent a ton of time prepping some new hands-on activities for that. And it all worked out. It was planned for a 90 minute workshop and nobody came to it. So that leads me to believe one of two things, two possibilities. One, I did a terrible job of giving this, of writing the description of the workshop. Possible, possible. Two, uh, myself and the conference organizer overestimated the potential interest in the topic. Uh, so one of those two, it's one of those two things. I'm not sure which. Uh, has it been, you know, I had a three and a half hour drive home from the, from the conference. So I had to, I had some time to think about it. And those are the two options I came up with. And I really have had a loss for which it is. So if you have some thoughts on that, please send me an email. Let me know. Richard at burn.media. Best way to get a hold of me or tweet at me or Facebook me or LinkedIn me. I have Snapchat, but I never use it. So you can try that too. TikTok me. I got TikTok. Never use that either. But I have a TikTok account. So that's where I'm at with electronics and makerspaces. No one came to that workshop. Doesn't mean I won't offer it again. It just means that I might not build it up. I get so excited about it next time. I don't know. Back to my classroom, though. My freshmen are going full bore on some Arduino projects. They've covered all the basics. Everyone can make their LEDs flash. They can run sequences. They got all that. And now we're getting into some other programs. Uh, I've got one student who's doing some, some sensor-based things. I've got other students who are doing uh, some updates to Exploratorium's Science Snacks projects by incorporating Arduino. If you're not familiar with Science Snacks, it's a website from Exploratorium. And you'll find hundreds of hands-on learning projects uh, covering all content areas, all subject areas, tons of them. There's a great collection for STEM and engineering. I guess this is, that's redundant to say that, but engineering. And there's some ton, tons of projects in there. And I have some students who are uh, going to be updating them or, or not it's just updating them um, enhancing them by incorporating some arduinos uh, to you know, make make things run even better so i'm excited about that i'm excited about seeing what my kids are going to do with that uh, we got a whole bunch of stuff coming in we got a whole bunch of uh, bits and bots and pieces all coming together it's kind of a hot mess right now um, <laughs> but it's going to be good and as I mentioned, my senior year student is almost ready to publish his web app using pythonanywhere.com. So I'm excited about that too. All right. Now, as I mentioned, I got a lot of questions related to teaching online or remote teaching or prepping for being out of school for a long time. Um, so I answered that early on. So I did not include those questions in this week's Q&A. Here we go with Q&A that's not COVID-19 or coronavirus. Dear Richard, I'm Nordine from Morocco. I'm a teacher trainer and would like to know about easy tools to create an educational platform to use my trainees, blended learning resources with their tutorials, put courses, give assignments, discussion, etc. Thanks a lot. So I gave a couple of recommendations here. Number one, Google Classroom. If you have a Gmail account, you can set up your Google Classroom. You get all your all your trainees in there. It's one option. Uh, another option you might want to 
take a look at is good old Edmodo. Yes, it's still around. Edmodo still exists and still, still runs well. You also might try something like Otis. Otis.com, they have a free service you could avail yourself of as well. Question number two came from Lori. And Lori asked, I was hoping to pick your brain. I have 5th, 6th, 7th, and 8th graders writing an essay, principal's directive, but I would like to make each grade turn their essays into presentations. Can you come up with some presentation tools? I'm thinking about 5th doing PowerPoints. What other tools can you recommend? Our technology consists of two Windows Thin clients, which have not worked since installed in October. And this is week four. We have no licenses to run Windows, so no computers. The iPads the classroom teachers don't want to share, and they have not been updated since last year. So to sum it up, this year my tech classes have been unenjoyable. Never know if the technology will be working. Back to the question, any recommendation on presentation tools? Could use some good ideas. Lori. So, Lori, whew, sounds like you are fighting a little bit of an uphill battle there, and I, I feel your pain. I've been there. I've done that. I will probably do it again. All right. Um, so, Lori, some things that came to mind here. If you don't want to do PowerPoint or or or, or Google Slides, either one, uh, if those aren't options or just you want to do something different, I would take a look at using something like uh, Adobe Spark or a Headliner. Uh, those could be good options. Uh, also, Lumen 5, which I featured last week or the week before, a couple of weeks ago, within the last couple of weeks, I feature Lumen 5 in a blog post and in a video. Lumen 5 will take your text and turn it into a video. So you might, might take a look at those options. Um, you know, one other thing you might consider doing, depending on, I'm not quite sure how much, you know, fourth, uh, fifth through eighth grade essays, uh, you know, five paragraph essays, I'm assuming there's something along those lines. You might do something as simple as just doing like a, I shouldn't say simple. I do something like, like an infographic. You can use canva.com, C-A-N-V-A, canva.com, and do an infographic in Canva. They've got lots of templates that kids could follow. You might try doing that. Uh, storyboard that also has some infographic templates, but storyboard that, um, I think you have to pay for their templates, so strike that. Canva's templates are free, so check that out. Could be a good option for you. Good luck, Lori. All right, question number three comes from Jody, who writes, uh, I get so much from your posts. Thank you. You're welcome. I really like the quick rubric you shared. I do have a question about it. Can you enter the scores you want? For example, we want our writing team to be writing rubric to be, be worth 10 points. We would like the structure to be with four, content ideals to be worth four, and the conventions and mechanics to be worth two. Looks like you might not let me divide my total that way. Thank you. Thank you for your feedback, Jody. Jody, you're right. Unfortunately, quick rubric only evenly divides all the categories in your rubric. Um, so you're, and I know exactly what you're trying to do, Jody, because that's exactly how I did my, did slash do my rubrics. Is that I give more weight to certain parts of the rubrics than others. Right? So, for example, I have a section in my rubric which is completed on time. Right? And I only make that worth 10 points, but I have other sections that are worth 25 points. Unfortunately, a quick rubric doesn't do that. But you can do that with the Google Sheets add on called Online Rubric. You can also do that in Google Classroom's new rubric tool as well. You can divide the divide the points up however you want. So consider that option. Hope that helps. Question number four. Got a lot of questions this week. Question number four came from Kathy, who says, "Can you recommend some reliable teaching videos about cyberbullying for fourth to sixth grade? We Google some and are not satisfied with what we found." Thank you, Kathy. Kathy, I recommended I recommended Kathy Planet Nutshell. Planet Nutshell has a series of videos about cyber safety, cyber security, cyber responsibility. 
that was produced in conjunction with the Utah Education Network. The videos came out three or four years ago. They're still really good. So take a look at those. And another question came in here <clears throat> from Ann. Uh, first time user teacher of second graders. I'd like to make up the lesson on my MacBook Pro and have it available for Chromebooks and iPads. We are one on one school. Is this possible? Do I have to make lessons on the same platform as my students will use so I don't so I don't ask for what they can't access? Our iPads and Chromebooks are old. Thanks, Ann. So Ann. I wrote back to Ann asking about what kind of lesson she's trying to do. And I haven't heard back, but I assumed she meant video lessons. And so for that reason, I'll, I'll based on that assumption, I will say that, uh, no, you don't have to do it on the same platform. If you want to make, uh, make a video lesson for your students by using your MacBook Pro, when your video is done, save it as an MP4 file, upload it to YouTube or upload it to Google Drive or upload it to, your, to OneNote, wherever you want to share it, Dropbox, whatever you want to do, share it with your students and they can watch it on whatever device they want. And last question of the week. This podcast is going a little bit longer than normal. I attended the Practical Ed Tech Summer Camp last summer. I was the odd duck who teaches students at the college level who want to become teachers. Currently, we introduce the students to three pieces of software, Smart Notebook, Kidspiration, and Inspiration. We take a constructivist approach by assigning groups to each piece of the software and challenging them to learn the software and then teach it to the rest of the class. Recently, we discovered that Kidspiration.com has gone out of business and we're looking at replacements. Do you have any suggestions for software that's currently being used in elementary and secondary classrooms that would be worth exploring as possible replacements? Any suggestions you might be able to offer would be appreciated. Dick. Well, that is a bummer about Kidspiration. I liked it too. So I have a couple of suggestions here. One, you could use Google's online Jamboard. So you don't have to own a Jamboard to use Google's online Jamboard program. So you might take a look at that. Uh, I also like Padlet. Padlet has some mind mapping and flowchart templates you could have people use. So you take a, take a look at some of those. Uh, I used to recommend Real Time Board, but they have changed their business model and changed their, changed their name and their business model. It still still works the same way, but they changed their name and their business model, and, it, and it's n not really suited for schools. It's more for more for workplace now. Uh, so those are the two I'd, I'd check out: is Google's uh, Jamboard online, and see if Padlet has something for you. I'd also throw in I throw in that I think a lot of people would probably say Wakelet, but Wakelet doesn't really have those templates or that flexibility for mind mapping or making flow charts not yet anyway maybe they will in the future but not yet so that is the end of practical ed tech podcast episode number 36 can't believe i've done 36 of these things this year i uh, didn't know how long i'd keep going when i started let's go for 50 let's see what happens when we hit 50 uh, anyway Hope you all have a great weekend. As always, if you have any questions for me, feel free to shoot me an email, richard at burn.media. And don't forget 